We have prepared a selection of our videos for you in case you missed watching the previous videos. You've come to the perfect site if you're searching for something to watch while you're bored, something to play in the background, or want to learn more about unusual teas. Make sure to like and subscribe to our channel and turn on the notification option to be notified when new videos are posted. If you've previously seen our videos, please post the timestamps of the videos you'd suggest to others in the comments area. Let's get this started. What's the most unfair thing you've seen, viewer edition? Hey folks, this is a quick content warning for the video. There are a number of these stories that have varying degrees of child abuse uh, in them. So if you're uncomfortable with that, just kind of brace yourself, know that it's coming, or you may even want to skip this video. Story one. When I was in grade seven, there was this girl who I hated, and for a very good reason. The year before, she practically forced me to be her girlfriend and essayed me nearly weekly for a year. I couldn't get away from her since she knew where I lived. If I tried to break up with her, she'd just come to my house the next day. She also threatened to off herself multiple times. I desperately needed to get away from her, so I reported her vaping to the principal. Keep in mind, we were both 11 at the time. She got really peed off and stopped talking to me. The next year, we were put in the same class. This is because the school counselor saw us hanging out and thought we were friends. That whole year was hell. She told me to KMS nearly, she told me to off myself nearly daily and would threaten to come to my house and kill my cats with graphic depictions of what she would do to them. She got the rest of the class in on it too. The whole day I would have things thrown at me and people were constantly yelling at me, touching me and getting in my personal space. This is because the girl knew that because of her, I couldn't stand being touched. I've also always been extremely sensitive to noise. The teacher saw all of this and did nothing. One time we were doing group projects with randomly assigned groups. None of my group members were at school that day, and obviously I couldn't ask anyone else in their group. My teacher asked if there was anyone specific I'd like to be with or if he should just place me randomly. I told him he could put me wherever, but to please not put me with that girl. Me immediately got an angry look on his face and asked to talk to me in the hall. We were out there for a while, but basically he said that I shouldn't have said that because how do I think that makes her feel? He had higher expectations for me and hoped I would be nicer in the future. I told him about the bullying multiple times and the most he's done is talk to the girl and ask her to please be nicer. Obviously that didn't work. Eventually, after months of this, I snapped. I screamed. I told her I hate her and threw an empty plastic water bottle at her. She had just thrown a metal one at me and left a pretty bad bruise on my back. I then started crying and stormed out of the classroom. I got sent to the office and my parents were called. I also wasn't allowed to have a lunch break the following day. I don't know how teachers can possibly care this little for their students. Sometimes I do think that it's teachers not caring. There are unfortunately just crappy teachers and crappy parents and stuff out there. Other times I think it's they just don't see it. <clears throat> and there are sadly a lot of kids out there who might exaggerate these kind of claims and so teachers aren't as apt to believe it. Doesn't make it okay, but it is something to understand because oftentimes these kind of bullies are really good at manipulating other people and manipulating how they are perceived by people who are not their victims. And it's unfortunate. I hope that you can get some help. Talk to folks that you trust. Do whatever you can. Just, yeah, get some distance between you and this person. Story two. I have a story. When I was younger, I had this pink Disney princess lamp that I absolutely loved. One day, my little brother came in and said, do you think the bulb is hot? And I said, yeah, probably. So he touches it, then runs out holding his hand in pain and tells my parents that I made him touch it. What? So my dad came in, took my lamp out of my room, destroyed it, and then threw it back in my room while I was in tears. A couple years later, I got another lamp that was blue that I loved, but not as much as the Disney princess one. And the same little brother walks in, asks me if it's hot, and I say, yes it is, please don't touch it. Well, this genius touches it again and runs out and tells my parents that I made him touch it. And both times this happened, I told them that I didn't do that, but they didn't believe me. So my dad comes in, takes, again, takes the lamp out, destroys it, and throws it back in my room. And I cry again. Fast forward a couple years, I never got a new lamp. 
but it's Sunday and my mom is helping me curl my hair and she leaves the room for a second. And the exact same little brother comes in, asks me if the curling iron is hot, and I say, yes, it is. And then my little brother touches it and says, ouch, and pulls his hand away. Maybe 10 seconds later, my mom walks back in and my brother says that I burnt him with the curling iron. And I start crying because I feel like my dad is either going to destroy it or my mom is going to burn me as a punishment. But through my tears, I hear my mom say, really? Because I heard you ask if it was hot. And I feel like that was a little bit of an understanding from my mom, and maybe she realized that I wasn't lying about the lamp incident. I never did get a new lamp until I was 17, so about 11 to 10 years later. And everyone believed my little brother, and still do. Even if he's lying, he still gets away with anything. Thank you for letting me vent. You are welcome. As uh, an older brother to uh, multiple younger siblings, yeah, sometimes siblings will just try and do dumb stuff to get you in trouble or just to test limits and boundaries, and it sucks. But the way your dad handled that is not okay. That's bad parenting. Just every step of that. Even if he believed the little brother and wanted to punish you, to break a lamp that you like and then throw it back in your room while you're crying? Plain and simple bad parenting. Dad, I hope that you're doing better and maybe learn to chill out a little. Story three. My parents have been divorced for years. Throughout that time, my mom has always respected me and made me feel safe around her and at her house. My dad yells at the smallest things and thought I wanted to change my name out of spite and therefore wouldn't call me by my name. My mom lost custody of me and my siblings, and we were only able to visit her a few days a week. I'm extremely close to my cats that live there, and they're like brothers to me. I care about her and the cats much more than I care about my a-hole dad and actual siblings. Recently, a few months ago, my mom was found in her boyfriend's car with H in it. It wasn't for her, it was for him. Her boyfriend has brain damage, and apparently it helped with the pain. He's since stopped using from what I've heard. Since then, my dad has forbidden me and my siblings from going to my mom's house. I've seen my mom twice since then, and I haven't seen my cats at all. My mental health has been getting worse and worse because of it. I don't blame either my mom or her boyfriend. They're both good people, and her boyfriend helped her a lot and saved her from killing herself, but my a-hole dad doesn't trust either of them. Apparently, he wants my mom to pay for supervised visits with us and even wants her to pay child support. My mom is pretty tight on money at the moment, and my dad can definitely take care of us just fine money-wise, so he doesn't need it. I hate my dad so much. He doesn't realize how much this is hurting me, and even if he did, he probably wouldn't care. The only thing keeping me alive right now is the hope that I'll be able to see my cats, my brothers again, as well as how sad all of my friends would be. I just want to go home and feel safe. Sorry for absolutely venting everything in a random YouTube comment, but yeah, life is really unfair sometimes. Story 4. When I was in high school, I had an emotionally abusive teacher, and while she did a lot of awful things, the first one that comes to mind when I think of things being unfair is when I came back from French class one day, and she immediately asks why I skipped French class. I hadn't skipped class, and she had no reason to think I did, since I had never skipped class before, and I knew that we'd had a substitute teacher that day. I even made a point to personally introduce myself to the sub, so there was no reason for her to mark me absent. I proved beyond any reasonable doubt that I had been exactly where I was supposed to be, but I still got detention and a lecture. And I knew from experience that telling another teacher what was happening would, at best, result in me being told that I'm exaggerating and I'm sure it's not that bad, let's hear what your teacher has to say. And then my argument would be completely ignored because they never believe the special ed students, especially when it's against their teachers. And telling my mom didn't help because even though she agreed that it was incredibly unfair, it wasn't enough to get her fired. So nothing was done about it and she continued to be a balrog and specifically target me because I was the only one who was willing to call her out on her BS. I wish I had advice for this, but it seems like so many schools operate on like the opposite principle that the law is supposed to, where you're innocent until proven guilty. They're just like, someone accused you of something, and you go, I, I, have, I have people that can corroborate that I did not do this thing that you said that I did. And they're like, too bad, you're getting punished. Like, teachers, people in charge of schools, do you have any idea what you're teaching children 
by acting like this to them because you're doing a very bad thing when you do that. Story five. I read a story on Reddit about a guy who was asking for marriage advice. His wife was unfaithful and extremely abusive towards him, but even then he was just trying to save his marriage. I remember the cold feeling I felt in my stomach reading his story because it genuinely sounded like his wife enjoyed hurting him. Redditors encouraged him to stop trying to save his marriage and divorce her, not only for his own sake, but for the sake of his two children. Redditors eventually gave the OP the courage to file for divorce, which he proudly proclaimed in an update. His wife found his Reddit post and saw that he was planning to divorce her. She murdered their two children in retaliation. She did end up going to prison for it, but her family blamed OP for what she did and actually prevented him from visiting the graves of his two children. Reddit really rallied around this guy to help him, but damn what a tragedy. He lost his two children to an evil woman and the people in his life reacted like he was the bad guy and not her. What's the creepiest thing you've seen about other kids' families? Viewer edition. Story one. So this story isn't as horrific as the others or anything, but just very unsettling. I have these two friends that are sisters, identical twins, so they have the same friends, go to the same places, they're just usually always together socially. They go to their friend's house all the time to hang out. So for some backup context, the friend of the twin's older brother is a lying, manipulative bully, and I was his main target. He makes himself seem like a perfect little angel on the outside, but on the inside he shows major signs of narcissism, and from what I've experienced, I think he's a sociopath. He's caused me mental scars. But there's a certain circle of friends who sees through him, same for the friend's parents. He's stolen my pet before and killed it, showing no remorse, but I'm not going to go on about him, but you get the idea. He's the mean rich kid who seems to be a nice kid. The dad isn't so perfect also. So the three girls are going to their friend's room to change into their bathing suits, and the two sisters are expecting for the door to be closed when they change. But the friend doesn't, so they're like, um, aren't you going to close the door? And the friend is basically saying no, because it's normal. But the two sisters know it's not. It's especially weird because they have two other guys in the house, and they're, I want to say, 11 to 12, so it's weird. So they push to get the door closed, and they do. But then mid-change, the dad barges in and says, boo, and chuckles. He knew that they were getting ready for the pool, and he didn't know if they were changed or not. What a creep. Just makes me think about what else goes on in the house. Story 2. It's the other way around. I was the weird kid because for me and my siblings, it was strange to see families that we'd be considered normal. I would go to my cousin's place across the street, spick and span, maybe a few toys on the floor, a board game on the table. But for us, our house was something comparable to a hoarder's mess. Trash and such piled up, various belongings still stuck in boxes where they'd never see the light of day again. It never felt homey like the farmer neighbor's place down the way whose home is tinted with sepia and nostalgia in my memories, but it was my home. I can recall having CPS called not once but twice and being coached on what to say to them so that I wouldn't be removed from my mother's care. They show up, we clean up, and the cycle repeats. It was awful. I can't help but wonder how many kids ever actually made it past the threshold of our door. I can never recall playing inside with kids my sister would hang out with, but I think if anyone did see it, that they would have found it weird. Story 3. When I was in elementary school and middle school, I had a friend who was really happy and bubbly. She was a joy to be around, and so when she invited me over to her house for a sleepover, I assumed she would have a fun family. I was very wrong. The second we entered her house, her mood completely changed. She became silent and dreary. We were greeted by her mom, who was a tall, lanky woman with stringy black hair. She smiled, but seemed uncomfortable with the thought of me in their house. Her father didn't live with them. I immediately felt uneasy, even as a small child. My friend was very adamant that I be very quiet and clean up after myself, even though I would do that already. Her mom never watched TV, she just sat in a room at the end of the hall at a desk. I have no idea what she was doing, but she always sat very still. The house was always very clean, and my friend would scold me if I made a sound any louder than a whisper. I would sleep over semi-often and get used to the silence, but it's still very eerie to remember. I just, I have such a hard time figuring out why people like this even have kids. 
they don't seem to like to have them around. Or maybe something happened after she had the kid and the mom's going through some trauma. It sounds like there's some trauma going on there. I don't know what the answer is, but that is no way for a kid to live. And, you know, parents, if you're starting to like lean towards this stuff, maybe therapy might be helpful. Maybe you need to work through some issues and that's okay. Lots of people go to therapy. I go to therapy. But please don't, don't put your kids through a childhood like this. That just, it seems kind of miserable. Hey there, folks. Uh, content warning for this video. A number of these stories uh, contain recountings of child abuse and even, unfortunately, S abuse. And so if you're sensitive to those topics, you might want to just know that they're coming or you may even wish to skip this video if it's too tough for you. Story four. For the first story, I have a similar story. In sixth grade, I was best friends with one of the quiet kids. She was very sweet, but also scared most of the time. I'll call her Sarah. Anyway, I tried to invite her over to my house once since we had never hung out outside of school. She told me she couldn't, and when asked, she said something along the lines of, I can't, my father won't let me hang out with people that don't speak Spanish or aren't relatives. I told my mother this, since I was the type to, of kid to tell my mother everything, and she offered that she could speak to Sarah's father and that maybe he'll allow it. I told my friend this, and she seemed very scared about that idea. She said that it wouldn't change his mind or anything. Okay. Now, Sarah was really into Harry Potter at the time and would read the books at school. I wasn't as much into it and had the whole collection of books they were gifted and offered them all to her. From that, I learned that if her father ever caught her with any Harry Potter book, it would either be destroyed in front of her or thrown into the garbage in front of her because he thought Harry Potter wasn't good for her. She ended up taking a couple of the books anyway and said that she'd try her best to keep them a secret. I don't know if the books were ever found by her father or not. Sarah ended up confiding more and more to me about her home life. She had a few siblings, I forget how many, maybe three or four, and all were younger than her. I forget all the things she told me, but eventually she told me that her father beat her mother frequently and was touching the second oldest sibling, I think, and Sarah inappropriately. She wanted me to keep it a secret. I remember asking her if she wanted help, and she nodded. We were in the playground. I told my mother, and she contacted the school counselor who contacted social services. I would also talk about Sarah with the school counselor. I remember having a panic attack that night. Police showed up at their house and questioned the kids and the mother. All of the kids lied because they were scared about what was going on. The mother lied as well, but I think that was because she was threatened so much by the father. Sarah did tell me that her father was threatening to send Sarah back to their native country, which was a third world country, if she spoke out against what was going on. I guess her sister got sent back to that country in the past. The police did a really crappy job with it. There were multiple reports on file about that family from neighbors hearing screaming from that house. The police just let the effing case go after interviewing the family because none of them said anything useful to the case. They didn't even question me. Me, the one person that was told most of all the crap that was going on there. We ended up graduating from that school and were off to high school. My mother decided to homeschool me and me, we moved away. I had another friend that I kept in touch with that went to that high school and I asked him if I could talk to Sarah. He ended up finding her and she told me that her father found out about me and that she wasn't allowed to speak to me anymore. We talked through Roblox when we weren't in school, but before when I was still naive to her situation, she tricked me into deleting our conversations and removing her as a friend because she told me she was hacked. I was so stupid back then. I still have messages on there between her and my other friends I just mentioned since we were all in a group, but there's nothing on there about her father or anything. Since then, I haven't heard from her. Sarah had told her other friends, I was friends with her too, about what was going on, but the friend never did anything about it. The friend was going through crap of her own, but that's no effing excuse. In sixth grade, we were 10 or 11. Uh, these kind of situations are so heartbreaking to hear about because it really does make people lose faith in both the police and child protective services. And I don't want to say that you shouldn't contact those people. Child Protective Services have helped a lot of people, but they're fallible. 
They don't always get the job done the first time. Sometimes it has to be reported multiple times, and that can be putting people in danger. And I don't know what the solution is, but I do wish that there was more education within like schools and whatnot about what kids can do if they're in those situations, how to keep records of stuff so that they have evidence to put up against these people, something. I just, I, I don't know what the answer is, but something more needs to be done. And I hope that Sarah is okay wherever she is. Story five. Concerning story four from the original video, I've seen something like that when I was 11, a kid invited me over to his house one day. We went into his house, left our jackets on the couch next to the door, and went to his room. Later, his mom comes home and barges into his room, demanding to know why the jackets and backpacks were just laying on the couch. It turned into an ugly argument when he stormed into the front room and pointed out that she did the same thing with her purse and coat and mentioned how he was fed up with her freaking out about trivial things. I told him, let's just go, after he brought up how I was the first friend he invited over in over a year. After we left the house, he told me that his mom scolded him and the last friend he had over because the throw pillows on the couch weren't the way she wanted them. Bottom line, if you're that adamant about having a clean and tidy house, don't have kids, or at least don't force your lifestyle onto them. It really is sad when kids can't be kids because their parents are neurotic clean freaks. It's not going to hurt or kill you if your throw pillows are all over the couch or there's a bag and jacket on a couch. What's the best history facts that actually happened? Viewer edition. Story one. So the item that everyone calls a pleasure tool, also known as the Wonder Wand, is not an intercourse toy. It is the item you spoke of being the first pleasure tool. It is what it was designed for and actually works as. It's a mechanical potato masher. I know that because I had a friend whose sister ordered one in the mail while she was 16. My friend pulled the box in and it was labeled his dad's name on it, and my friend asked his dad if he could open it and it had the wand inside of it. I, being a good two shoes asked what it was and my friend's dad pulled an over 100 year old catalog out and this was back in the late 1990s so that catalog is now over 120 years old at least well that catalog had the magic wand in it and it was and it claimed it was an automatic potato masher for the woman who has trouble mashing potatoes mostly due to old age the catalog actually said it's a great gift for your mother so that she can still cook for her hubby while being in her white hair age well my friend's dad asked if we wanted some mashed potatoes for dinner and to learn how to use it and well it works wonders as a potato masher. I actually wanted to get one for that, but the problem is finding a place that sells them that won't look at me like a weird pervert and a liar, but the truth is, yes, it does work as a potato masher. My friend's sister came home and saw us using her wonder wand to mash potatoes. The horror on her eyes was brilliant. Her dad washed it off and gave it to her and said, hope you mash a lot of potatoes with it. She threw it away in embarrassment, but her dad took it out of the kitchen trash, washed it, and put it in the drawer of electric kitchen tools. For a couple of months, she got mocked even by her older sister as well. After a few months, her dad gave her a brand new one with a note that said, I hope you can get a boyfriend that likes mashed potatoes because this is not a boyfriend, it's a potato masher. I miss that man. He died about five years ago. He was smart as hell. One time at the movie theater, there was a payphone that had a problem where we could hear the person on the other line, but they could not hear us, but they could hear the button presses. And really weird fact is every button had a slightly different sound. And he asked, what time do we want him to pick us up? And we pressed the two button. He said, press the two button again if that is a yes. And we did. He picked us up at two. We had a full three minute conversation using one to zero buttons, which had different sounds that only someone with the most useless modern time skill could master. No, it wasn't. It wasn't a potato masher. I'm sorry. I'm looking online. It was first invented in the 1960s. There might be something that looked like it from an old Sears catalog back that long ago, but no, I do not think it was a potato masher, nor do I think a magic wand uh, intercourse toy would make a good potato masher. I've mashed many a potato, it would be bad at it. And if for some reason, if you're actually right, and it was back in there, you know, like, oh, it's a, it's a potato masher, then the ad was a lie. It was a thinly veiled lie to be like, yeah, ladies, this will really mash your potatoes. But otherwise, <laughs> no, I don't buy it. I'm sorry. Story two, interesting supposed Bible facts. 
People in Old Testament times would supposedly base a man's worth off of how many children they had, to the point that each party would grab the other guy's balls during major contracts or oaths to signify what would happen if they broke said contract or oath. So there's a reason that testament, testify, and testicle sound so similar. In Roman times, your rank in society was based on how masculine people thought you were, and no man would willingly be the feminine figure in a homosexual relationship. Such positions would generally fall to young slave boys to make the owners look stronger in comparison, and thus homosexuals were often syn synonymous with aurists, as the ones who would take part in this would make a point of asserting their dominance over any women they saw too. There is a story of a guy whose concubine was arred to death who cut said dead concubine into 100 pieces to send to each god-worshipping tribe in order to present proof of the wrong that had been done. Old tribes responded and waged all-out war on the tribe the Aris belonged to until the tribe was wiped out. I looked it up, and testicle is like from Latin testius or something, which means to witness, so... Apparently there might be some truth to that. I don't know about the whole, like, guys grabbing each other's uh, twig and berries and everything to be like, ah, ah, do we have a deal? <laughs> but there's, there's something to it, I guess. Story three. Okay, the one where the woman was declared innocent in ancient Greece was partially wrong. She was on trial for public indecency, not heresy. Her reported words were supposedly, it would be heretical to cover these breasts up. We even know what she looks like because she was the model for every statue of Aphrodite from the time period, so she quite literally had a body that represented a goddess. The best part is there's actually another story where a woman was found innocent via beautiful breasts that occurred much more recently. A woman was accused of burglary, I forget where, but during her trial, her lawyer had her breasts measured in front of the jury to prove that she couldn't fit through the window that witnesses testified the burglar used to enter the building. Basically, if I had a nickel every time a woman's breasts got her declared innocent in a court of law, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's strange it happened twice. LOL. Story 4. I personally looked up the naked man in Mark and correct the video that it's in chapter 14, not 15, verse 51 to 52. Mark 14, 51, 52. And it describes the man didn't intentionally streak, but had a linen cloth cast about his naked body, meaning he only had a linen cloth covering his nakedness, and was following Jesus after being arrested to be taken to the palace of the high priests. But a group of young men laid hold on the man, assuming the young men took a hold of the man and his only piece of attire, and fled away naked from the young men who laid a hold on him. So by this, the man running naked was an unfortunate incident for him while trying to follow the guards who arrested Jesus. Story 5. One of my favorite historical stories takes place in Salem during the witch trials. They crushed a farmer under stones to get a confession out of him. The farmer, in classic farmer fashion, said nothing, even as they promised him a quick death if he would just admit to it. I like to believe he stared them down as they did it, and until their deaths they had nightmares of his cold, disapproving eyes. He knew if he made the false confession they'd legally be able to steal his property from his kids, so it was more than just honor and spite, he was protecting his people. Giles Corey was a mighty man. Giles Corey, you sound like a heck of a guy, and I'm sorry that you got crushed to death by lunatics who were just going around trying to kill witches and stuff. It, it makes no sense. The trials are like, I'd either confess and get a quick death, or don't confess, or, you know, like, say that you're innocent and get a slow death. That's not a trial. That's how idiots conduct business, and I just hate it, and I'm sorry, but, hey, good for you keeping uh, your family farm in the family and stuff, I guess. Story 6. Concerning Story 18 from the original video, we also have to remember that Hitler had a special bond, not... NSFW, to his mother, Clara. It is said that he had a picture with her all the time, also in the bunker when he shot himself. Clara tried to get children, but some of them died during childhood, so when Adolf arrived, he got all the love from Clara. Clara had cancer, and the Jewish doctor who treated her did it for free, actually. Hitler remembered the doctor who used all the time to help Clara, so when the Nuremberg Acts came in Germany and Austria, he was spared by those laws and acts. 
Story 7. Fun fact, the British Empire actually grew larger by losing the American Revolution. Before the Revolution, Britain's convicts were sent to the 13 colonies, but after the colonists gained their independence, Britain colonized Australia and New Zealand as new locations for their prisoners to be sent to. This newfound interest in Far Eastern colonization led to all of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Burma, Malaysia, and half of Papua New Guinea being colonized. Story 8. William was flawed, but he had a good understanding of politics, military tactics, and he also freed most slaves in England. Even the Pope was on board with him ruling England, and the only reason he was branded a tyrant was because of what he did to the North, but they were just being discriminatory because he was from Normandy, not England, and because it was during a rebellion even though he was the rightful ruler of England. And the stuff with Robert was justified because Robert was just a terrible person, especially with Odo in his head. Teachers, what's the worst classroom situation you've returned to? Viewer edition. Story 1. My teacher spotted someone in my class holding a pack of M&Ms and stopped him from opening because it contains peanuts. Let's call the boy Nut. The girl near him is severely allergic to nuts. Nut told the teacher that it may contain peanuts, but my teacher said he still cannot eat it. Nut got really angry and yelled at my teacher, saying that he's allergic to peanuts, but he can eat it. My teacher kept saying that he still couldn't eat it, but opened the M&M package and started eating it in front of her. My teacher quickly sent the girl out of the class. The teacher went out of the classroom to get help from another teacher. While my teacher was outside the class, a boy, let's call him Apple, tried to convince Nut not to eat it, but then Nut started swearing at Apple. I didn't think much of Nut swearing because almost all the class swears while the teacher isn't there. I just sat there and ate some grapes until Nut did something that surprised me. He threw a chair at Apple. Luckily, Apple dodged it and ran out of the classroom. The other girl beside her quickly backed away from Nut. A teacher soon came and started talking to Nut. My teacher started calling the office. That's when Nut started crying and yelled out our teacher saying the R word, dumb and stupid. Once our teacher was done calling the office, she walked the class to the school chapel and sent two students to find Apple and the other girl allergic to nuts. Once we sat down, the teacher talked to us about allergies and how people can do stuff without thinking when they are mad. I was surprised how calm she was about the whole situation. Some students who were classmates with Nut last year said that this happened before. I knew we could be like that. I was classmates with Nut in the first grade, but I didn't know he would do all that. Once we finally went back to the classroom, the class was a mess, chairs and desks were flipped over, and pencils were all over the floor. Only a few desks, such as mine, survived. Me and the rest of the students had to clean up the classroom. I assumed that Nut would have been suspended, but he was there in class the next day. The only thing good about the whole situation was that we skipped math. I mean, anything that gets you out of math class is a net positive in my book. <laughs> I mean, realistically, I know nut allergies can be pretty severe as far as allergies go. Like, they're one of the more severe ones, so I don't know if the teacher overreacted or not. I don't know enough about those things, but it does sound like you said the teacher was awfully reasonable about stuff and not expelling the students, so honestly, that's pretty much a thumbs up to me for that teacher in that school for handling things, I mean, better than some would. Story 2. Little context. In my country, students stay put in the same room the whole day, and it's the teachers that rotate between classrooms, and we would have about five-minute period to ourselves between classes. So one day in middle school, during one of those five minutes in between classes, the students started playing around, and it got to the point where they started throwing things around. First harmless things like paper balls, then it escalated to pens, pencil cases, and even an effing nail clipper. Eventually, they started throwing around a whole effing apple with full force until it started to fall apart, leaving its flesh everywhere with all its collisions and crap. The chunks of mutilated apple were then used as projectiles as well, but there was still the larger hole, which was mostly intact, that was still being thrown around too. Someone then threw it at the ceiling, and it hit a ceiling lamp, causing one of its glass panes to plummet to the ground and shatter into three large pieces upon impact. Everyone was silent with shock. 
In a panic, they all started to figure out what to do with the situation until someone had the idea to make it seem like it just fell on someone's head out of nowhere. The thing is, they tried putting the largest of the three pieces of broken glass upon the ceiling by sticking it clumsily into what remained of the lamp, which just ruined the whole plan because they should have just left it lying on the floor. Now it was clear that it had been tampered with. When the next teacher arrived, he found everyone quiet in their seats, debris and apple pieces everywhere, with three students coming up to him holding two chunks of broken glass, telling him about how they had fallen on someone's head. Obviously, he didn't buy it, and like 11 of us, including me, even though I literally didn't participate, got in trouble for it, and the school sent us to watch a play about drugs and AIDS as punishment. <laughs> the students have been misbehaving. They need to learn a lesson. We don't have any lessons about this particular kind of circumstance. I don't care. Just teach him any old lesson. <laughs> I mean, I guess you got to learn about, you know, drugs and AIDS, so that's probably good. Story 3. This didn't happen as a result of the teacher leaving, but because my Spanish teacher last year gave zero Fs about everything other than cell phones. There were plenty of incidents that happened in class, but this is the worst one. The periods at my school are over an hour long, so you can imagine how boring they can get. During the middle of a lesson, all of a sudden, I hear a small explosion. Not really an explosion, but I don't know how else to describe it. Go off and smoke by the person in the row next to mine. Someone stuck a mechanical pencil into an outlet. The class convinced her that someone had dropped something really heavy, so the lesson continued. Later on, this time directly behind me, I hear another explosion, but way louder and see a spark out of the corner of my eye. Someone else did the same thing, but effing stabbed it. The whole outlet was covered in ash and part of the carpet was burnt. This time, the teacher realized what was going on and acts appropriately. When the period ended, I got the videos of it happening, both times airdropped. The next week, the two students got suspended and there was this zebra pattern duct tape on the two outlets, along with that we had to write about what happened in English. Pretty sure she left once the school year was over. Story 4. I remember I was in biology class and the teacher had to leave for a bit. She didn't give a reason, but I don't think she went far. Soon after she left, this one kid thought it would be funny to go and turn off the lights, so he walked over casually and turned them off. I guess a girl wasn't paying attention and didn't notice the boy walking up to the switch, so when the lights went out, she screamed. Some other kids in the room started mocking her by screaming and laughing at her, and other kids started getting in on it too, myself included. It devolved into us just screaming or making monkey noises. It lasted for about 10 seconds until the teacher came back. She turned on the lights, and everyone went silent. The boy who flipped the switch had made his way back to his desk, so when the lights came back on, we were all just sitting there silently looking at her. Needless to say, she was peed, but since it wasn't destructive and there was no way for us to figure out who was actually taking part in the yelling and nobody snitched on Light Switch Kid, she just scolded us for like five minutes and went back to what she was doing before she left. Story 5. Not a teacher, but the student. In my first year of middle school, we had a big group chat in an app that was called Line. It's basically a really popular messaging app that pretty much everyone in Japan uses. For the first few months of the first term, I was actually in it. That is, until I suddenly felt like I didn't want to be in the group anymore on a Wednesday and left the group. The next day, the class found out that a girl was streaming one of the classes on Instagram, and the faces of some of the students were out on the internet. And after school ended, everyone went absolutely ham on her. A lot of students from other classes even joined in to get a piece of the action, and half the class was berating her, and the other half was protecting her. At its peak, one of my classmates even made a poll to ask people whose side they were on. I had no idea about this because I had left the group a day prior. Come next day and I get a message saying that a huge portion of the class was in trouble from one of my friends. When I get to school, the girl is on the verge of tears, I felt somewhat bad, and the teacher tells us what happened. The video is deleted now and it got pretty much no views in the first place. I really dodged a bullet. Story 6 Man, it didn't happen when the teacher left, but when the teacher was in the classroom, happening in high school. The student was basically the class a-hole and would mess with people, constantly use the bathroom just to skip class, everything under the sun. One day, the teacher told the student they couldn't go to the bathroom. Student was PO'd, whipped out an empty soda bottle, went to the corner, peed in it, 
and capped it. I half expected the SOB to start flinging it around. Student got a referral to the office. I've had bomb threats at my school, kids pulling knives out of their bags and getting caught. This was serious stuff since Columbine happened right around the time I started high school. Okay, the bomb threats and knives are genuinely pretty scary and stuff, but I don't know. I, I'm a, I believe that if a student needs to go to the bathroom, teachers let him go to the bathroom. But if a kid is constantly using that as a way to, like, skip class and stuff, I don't know what the solution to that is. But even still, God, just peeing in a bottle, I don't know. I, no one's in the right. Just ever, stop. Everyone just stop. Story 7. I was a first aider in college. The teacher of a special needs class had climbed onto a chair, which then broke, causing her to fall and hurt her back. Another first aider had seen her and called an ambulance. I was called in afterwards to a scene out of a nightmare. The shock of seeing their teacher hurt had caused one guy to fall out of his wheelchair. Another was having a fit under a table. Another was screaming and rocking. It was like being in a training video, prioritizing the students and getting the situation under control. As I didn't know the students, I called an ambulance for the one who had a fit and got told off by their family as it often happens, and they were fed up with having to go to the hospital unnecessarily. What uh, unethical life hacks do you know, viewer edition? Hey folks, quick disclaimer here from your buddy Mr. Facts, just letting you know that all the advice here, we're presenting it for entertainment purposes, not encouraging you to do this or condoning any of it. Please be ethical, follow the law, and all that other jazz. Anyway, let's get started. Story 1. If you're at a concert and want to get a better spot up front, bring a flashlight and hold it at eye level while making a vertical line on the floor with the light and saying, make a hole, over and over. People will just move. You can get into any outdoor festival you want by arriving an hour or two before they open wearing a backpack. Security only stopped me once from 20 feet away and didn't even ask to see what was on my lanyard. You can also go to the location of any big outdoor concert before, like Lollapalooza, and bury alcohol under a tree in plastic bags. Dig it up while there. Works with anything you want to bring in that may not be allowed. If you live in a big city like Chicago or New York, ask a bike messenger for a spare bag and hang it in your back, back window. Cops will think you're a courier and not ticket you. Alternatively, you can also find a car with a ticket and remove the envelope, sticking the ticket under a windshield wiper. Hang the envelope off your driver's side mirror or where the cops in your city put them. If you live in a smaller city that has meter parking, find out the ticket cost for not paying. In most cases, it's cheaper than just paying the full day's rate. In the small town I lived in during college, it was 25 cents per hour, two bucks a day, the ticket was one dollars, if paid that day at the station, which was on my way home anyway. You can also put your coin in and only half turn the dial. Most meter maids will fully turn it, starting your time then, told me to buy a meter, told to me buy a meter maid, and used for a long while. Holy cow, that was a lot of rapid fire advice, and uh, yeah, some of it seems pretty doable, some of it not so much. You want me to go out to where a festival's gonna be in a few days, dig a hole under a tree, bury alcohol, then go to the festival, dig it back up just to have a drink? How desperate do you think I am for a drink? Fairly desperate. Story 2. Former AMC manager here. It was 10 years ago, so I don't know if everything holds up still. A. If you ask for a new cupper bag, you'll get new ones for the refills. Give it a little time after you walk in, though, especially if it's slow. The ticket taker could recognize that you just walked in and never went to concessions. B. There's a button near the top of all the exit doors that, when pressed, stops the doors from shutting fully. After entering and figuring out what auditorium you'll be in, go press the button on the nearest exit door, then go ask for your money back at guest services. As long as it's within 20 minutes of the start of the movie, it's a policy to give a full refund. Then just go back in through the exit doors. C. Anytime you do anything sketchy at the movie theater, make sure you make eye contact with staff. It was always obvious that someone was trying to movie hop or do the refill trick when they'd avoid eye contact. If you act confident, no one will question you. Want to know my big movie theater trick? It's that I found, like, the least expensive theater near me that still has, like, really good food and stuff that gets delivered right to the seats, found out which day they sell the cheapest tickets, 
and then just go there at like noon because I'm freelance and so I make my own hours and stuff. So not at all actionable for a ton of you out there, I know, especially if you don't live in a, you know, metro area with a lot of different theaters. But if you do, I'll tell you, there are a lot of theaters that are desperate enough for people to come that they've got like, you know, Tuesday afternoon showings for five, six dollars or something. I, I think it's worth it. Story three, you can pretty much call any 800 number on the back of anything and complain about the product to get a free replacement. I called Lay's and told them I found a green potato chip. Couple of weeks later, coupons in the mail for five free bags of chips. If a McDonald's drive-thru is kind of busy, go inside and tell them you ordered in the drive-thru and they left out fries or something else. They'll usually give you whatever you claim wasn't added without asking for a receipt. Even if you do claim you weren't given one by the drive-thru attendant. You can also call the 800 number on the McDonald's bag and complain about the food and you'll get free coupons from the franchise owner in the mail. You also don't have to complain. For example, I've called Tabasco and told them I love their sauce. They mailed me a free t-shirt. Story 4. The one about the Hampton Inn is wrong on several levels, at least with my experience as a front desk supervisor. The hotel has to be given the opportunity to fix the problem, and only if unable to, or don't have another room available, then they can give the 100% guarantee. If you waited to tell us at checkout, we would not give the refund. Also, people that have a lot of service recoveries are tracked and will lose their benefits if found to be abusing. Furthermore, I highly doubt the property is reimbursed by Hilton. Hilton nickel and dimes their properties as a way to achieve compliance. For example, if a complaint isn't responded to by management in 48 hours, Hilton will respond instead and charge the property $500 for it. Story 5. Target will give you whatever price you claim the unmarked item costs if it's under $20. False. I found plastic forks that were like $1 for a decent sized box, but it turns out some employee put all the bigger $3 boxes in the $1 space on the shelf, so they were in the wrong place. Not only did Target make me and my girlfriend sit there for 5 plus minutes while an employee walked to the back of the store to check, but when they came back they said they had to pay the $3 even though they were being advertised for $1 and it was the fault of one of their own employees. Yeah, on the original video, there were a number of people who were like, people at such and such a place, are just, they're going to be so lazy that if you just ask them for a thing, they'll give you whatever you want. That's very dependent on where you're going, because I have been to some places, you know, where they are just, you know, they could care less. And I've been to some places where they are on top of things. So, yeah, you, you got to judge those on a case by case basis. Story 6. I got two great hacks. At Disney, you can go to guest services and say, you have ADHD and it is hard to stand in long lines. Disney is not allowed to ask for proof of your difficulties and you can get to skip the lines without paying extra money. The second hack is for people that love Culver's. Made this hack and works pretty well. Once you have finished your meal, before you leave, ask one of the workers for a kids to go bag. 75% of the time, they will give you the bag with no questions asked, giving you a coin. Once you have 10 coins, you can get a free full meal or a plushie and a free scoop of ice cream. Story 7. That last one about how strict movie theaters are with counting cups, bags, etc. is very true. Knew a guy who was a manager of one many years ago. A brand new box of cups was accidentally thrown away, 500 plus cups. He had to go down to the dumpster site and search through trash to find the box as proof that they were thrown out and that money wasn't stolen from the theater. Would have lost his job if he didn't. Story 8. Technically, you can legally dumpster dive in the U.S. and the store owners can't put a lock on it because it can still be considered merchandise or something. You could probably get charged with trespassing, though, so just ask a manager or the owner of the store if you could receive permission. Also, if it's after a blackout or hurricane or something similar, most of the frozen food or perishables will be in the dumpster because of FDA regulations, and big props if you go to a store and they carry caviar after a blackout. I get why they're so, like, against dumpster diving, because, you know, some of these big stores are like, people are just not go not going to buy this stuff on purpose so they can get it for free out of the dumpster, which, I fine, I guess, for some people, maybe. But on the other hand, just, 
I don't know. Why do we have to be so concerned about that? You know, I, I, boy, when I was a teenager, I did some dumpster diving with friends and we got some cool stuff and, but we would not have bought, we would not have bought that stuff. Otherwise we were teenagers. We did not have money. <laughs> Story nine. I can additionally confirm the legitimacy of the fluorescent safety vests. I used to landscape and the vests were mandatory. You'd be surprised how many people think you're there for, well, whatever, anything construction. I've had to tell people I'm not there to fix their TV or air conditioner, so no, I do not need to know the location of their hidden key. Story 10. At the gas station air pumps that take quarters, you can use pennies instead if you shoot them in the coin slot fast enough. Also, some coin washing machines and dryers can be paid for using the underwire from a bra to ring up credits, but only the ones that have a coin slot where you put in one coin at a time. Story 11. I have a great life hack for you. At my school, even though I have allowances for my ADHD, sometimes my teachers still don't let me turn things in late. So I'm very good at lying, so I just tell the teachers that I left it at home and make sure that I told a couple of my friends that I did not spill the truth. Works every time. Story 12. Australian Social Services, Centrelink, ask job hunters to give a job description and a link to a job ad you have applied for. You could write a separate cover letter and resume for each relevant job, or you could just throw together something resembling a resume and just send it off to every ad listed on a job site, which often just has an upload resume page. As I actually want a job, I use the hard option. Still no job, though. What's the best no experience required job? Story one. I used to work for a small clothing store at a resort hotel in Waikiki. I worked many retail jobs in my time in Hawaii and had to deal with about as many rude customers as you would anywhere else, but something about this place put all the customers in a good mood. Maybe the fact that we were on uh, the beach. And I almost never had to deal with rude people. It was a fairly slow gig too, which gave my coworkers and I a lot of downtime for BSing, which we did plenty of. It was the only retail job I ever had where I never felt stressed out. On a lot of days, we would open the doors to let the tropical breeze in. The standard outfit was shorts, t-shirt, and flip-flops. Us guys who worked there loved to flirt with the girls in a little jewelry kiosk next to us, and we would get hit on regularly by bored teen girls and their drunk middle-aged mothers looking for a tropical island fling. We used to actually fight for who got to take out the trash because the dumpster was on the beach. We would always time trash takeouts for sunset, and even the manager didn't get angry when it mysteriously took us ten minutes to go to the dumpster and back. At the time, I was living in a studio apartment in Waikiki, just a couple blocks away, and it was a ten-minute walk to work for me. If that job had paid a living wage, I'd probably still be there, but I couldn't afford to live off my salary there, so I had to quit, move back to the mainland, and go to grad school so I could get a career job. I'm a college professor now, making a decent living in a respectable career, but Sometimes I wish I was still telling, selling t-shirts on the beach in Waikiki. That was beautiful. I've got to say, the not making a livable wage at your job does kind of make me question if it's, what was it, the best no experience needed job? Like, it sounds very lovely. And I've had jobs that were also very, very lovely jobs in a lot of respects, but, uh, when after leaving that job, I got to go home and eat ramen noodles every night because I couldn't afford anything else, I would not classify those jobs as best. Story two. I delivered pizza for three years and made more money now than I am working as a post-grad temp, $13 an hour, but I also don't spend 300 ish depending on the hours, a month on gas, so it's a trade-off. Most Friday and Saturday nights, if you factor in tips, I'd make a bit more than $20 an hour, but it was generally for only 3-4 to four hour bursts. When I started opening on the weekends, it was nice, because I'd get about 8-10 to 10 hours a day on my paychecks, then make it at least $120 on both Saturday and Sunday. And if it's football season, I'd sometimes make $500 from tips alone from a Friday night shift, then opening Saturday and Sunday. It's really dependent on hours, though. I worked 35 to 40 hours a week and worked longer shifts, but 
It worked because I was still in school, so working weird hours was easy. If you get into it but only work about 20 hours a week, you're generally working three-hour rushes, and while well, the burst money is okay, you aren't building the money on your paycheck, and you aren't going on trips where you take four to five deliveries, which is super efficient time money-wise. It's very easy to get stuck in pizza delivery if you're getting the good shifts and making good money. A lot of people used to take home cash in their pockets every night, and it's easy as crap. It tends to make every other occupation patients seem like a bad idea. I've seen quite a few drivers where I work not quit until they're forced to due to getting an accident or something. Working on like tips and stuff can be nice if you're someplace where you can get, you know, those big tips. The thing I hate about that kind of work is you just you don't have a reliable paycheck. You don't know because sometimes you're going to have just bad days. Sometimes you're going to have some huge order that takes up a ton of your time that you're expecting is going to leave quite a good tip, and they give you nothing. And I just, I gotta say, a nice, steady, de good paycheck, I will take over a roller coaster paycheck any day. Story three. Retail. Everyone should have a retail job once in their life for at least six months. You need no experience, but you will learn a lot from it. First, you will probably learn what your ambition is. If you think folding clothes at the Gap and nothing else is not all that bad of a way to spend a year, college might not be your future path. If you're racing out of work to try and get in some classes, you will learn how to manage time like a pro. Secondly, you will learn social skills. The ability, or perhaps art, of looking someone in the eye and having a conversation is something you need to practice. Without the glow of a phone nearby, it is possible. Third, you will learn that people, all people, are disgusting. Why is this important? Because once you realize that other people are human, you think before acting and act a little nicer. Psychological fact. Fourth, most importantly, you will be a better shopper. If you've had to fold shirts for an hour or serve people food for hours or clean bathrooms, you will always remember that when you are on the other end. Sure, some of you will feel vengeance and be, well, I clean this so they can. But the vast majority will remember how much they hated when people acted up and avoid that same behavior. The old golden rule in effect. Everyone should have a retail job once in their life for at least six months. That's a horrible thing to wish on people. Story 4. Sweeping Machine Driver. Drive a forklift-sized sweeper around during the day. Listen to whatever you want as loud as you want. Relatively good pay compared to other kinds of cleaning jobs. Story 5. Night Security Guard. Spend your evenings studying up to be something else. Story 6. Grain silo work. $25 an hour and mostly all you do is sweep or take a nap. And sometimes explode. Story 7. The railroad isn't a bad gig. Great retirement plan and regular pay. Engineers can make north of 100 k Just be prepared to be on call all the time. Railroads are definitely great employment. Local pay is $25 for a shop helper, which requires no experience. You've got to be on point, though, because if you screw up, the union will throw you under the train faster than the company. I was literally just talking to my friends, like, three days ago about how cool trains are and how much we all want to take, like, train trips. And man, if you got to, like, work on a train, like, being the engineer or even just, like, serving on a train or something, I don't know, that seems really cool to me. Like, there's just something very scenic and relaxed about trains versus, like, planes, which are just stressful and shooting through the sky, where there's not actually all that much to see sometimes. I don't know. Story 8. A couple years back, there was a girl who auctioned off her virginity for something like $700,000. I'd say that. This is the first job I've seen where no experience was absolutely required. Story 9. If you can get a doorman gig in Manhattan, it's 50 k a year plus a crap load of tips plus full benefits, holiday pay, sick time, personal time, and they offer classes to be an electrician and plumber and stuff like that. A good building you will see with 20 k per year in tips. 50 to 70,000 ain't much in Manhattan. Story 10. Hotel desk clerk. Get paid to play Civilization 5 10 hours a day. Light cleaning and other duties that take less than an hour. 
Story 11. This is pretty much only an option for girls, but nannying. I get paid $15 an hour to hang out at a wealthy family's house with their 7-year-old girl 20 hours a week. Yesterday I was there for 8 hours and we braided bracelets, colored, and played trivia. Story 12. Adult Entertainment Shop Manager. I had that job all through undergrad. The owner only came in Friday morning at 11 to pick up the deposits. Other than that, my only work was ordering more tapes on Wednesdays and restocking on Tuesday, plus 10 minutes of late tape collection calls. I gave myself all the day shifts and hired staff to work nights. What that meant was that I could sleep until 9.30 every morning, be done with work at 4, then get to my 4.30 or 7 p.m. class and always have my weekends free. I would bring in a lawn chair, do my readings, write essays, but mainly take naps behind the counter and barter free adult entertainment for free pizza, free vacuum repair, free plumbing, you name it. Sounds like you were a terrible frickin' employee. I mean, honestly, any job where you can work in a shop and just relax and have a lot of time to yourself and still make a living wage, that's a pretty solid job. You know, I worked at a front desk on midnights at a hotel for quite some time and I had like two hours of work in an eight-hour shift and the rest of the time I was playing like Game Boy Advance. It's the only time I've ever played through a Pokemon game in my life. Uh, yeah, those are pretty solid jobs. Story 13. Token white person on Chinese or Japanese boards. There are some people who are professional white people who sit on a few boards of directors in China or Japan just to make leadership photos look like they are an international bunch. Story 14. Stagehand. Most cities have labor companies that provide people for the entertainment industry specifically. Yes, the hours are long and the work can be heavy, but it generally pays well and you can be involved in some pretty nice events and concerts. I started out as a stagehand straight out of high school, worked hard, and moved up in the industry. I've worked in many countries on short and long projects. I now design and earn a good salary. It's still possible to make it without university. Story 15. As much as it could potentially be a nightmare, babysitting as a kid was a really, really easy way to have money like a 12-year-old. I would go over to a neighbor's house at like 6, feed two kids dinner, play a board game, put them to sleep, and then watch TV by myself and get paid for it. No experience required so much that literal children are trusted with human lives. It's really hit or miss depending on the kids or parents. Sometimes you get a good normal kid who eats his vegetables. Sometimes you get the spawn of Satan. Be a Twitch girl streamer. You play games and neckbeards give you money. Must be difficult for them with the new rules about showing cleavage and whatnot. Yeah, I would definitely want to have to deal with being a woman on Twitch because, you know, a lot of them don't deal with just some of the most horrendous harassment I've seen on the internet. They definitely don't deal with just some of the most deplorable degenerates in the world stalking them and stuff. <sighs> Man. So many of you folks online, ladies especially, you have my deepest sympathies because I've I have friends who do that stuff and I've seen what you put up with and I don't think I could handle that. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.